When we get together, we are going to be looking at the adolescent brain. And I really thank you for the prompt on this because I really got the chance to update the information about this topic, which is really ever changing. So based on new information about the brain, we have a better understanding of what's really going on at different developmental stages. And some of the bigger questions that have jumped out to us based on research by some of really the best people out there. For example, Jay Geed is one of the few people that have actually done longitudinal studies that have followed pre-adolescent brains for a longer period of time. And so understanding this concept that adolescence, you know, literally the etymology of the word really means the process of becoming ripe. Very cool idea, right? So how do we define the onset of puberty? Uh, how do we understand that the concept of being a teen is not the same as being an adolescent? So understanding those differences here. And then also suggesting, uh, do we consider adolescence really a developmental period rather than just a time, uh, an age of an individual, if we can sort of change our viewpoint there. And something we also want to share is that there are difficulties. There's a lot of problems with studying the adolescent brain, just as there are studying the early childhood brain and the aging brain. Mainly, they have to do with the need for more multidisciplinary perspectives, but the truth of the matter is that most people are still in their sort of silo. So the geneticists have one view of the adolescent brain. Uh, neuroimaging studies tell you something else. Neurobiological studies tell you something else. People who look at animals and adolescents and animals, like in rats, you know, tell you something else. Or looking at brain structures or brain volume at one level or the psychological angle of looking at social relationships or emotion and cognition links to a more and more sophisticated understanding, for example, graph theory, which is a mathematical theory showing how neural networks in the brain are actually linked through neuroconstructivism and the Connectome project leading to this different vision, you know, of network science or an appreciation of transdisciplinary studies. And the call that really exists right now of asking, you know, if we're going to be studying the adolescent brain in a serious way, we really better do this in a much more transdisciplinary way than has existed in the past. Because little quips of knowledge from each of these subgroups often lead to neuromyths about the brain. And so we have to be very, very careful to have a more broader, uh, more rounded out vision of the brain. So we'll look at what changes actually really do occur. Right now, the types of research, for example, the ABCD project, the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development longitudinal study that's going to be tracking 10,000 youths for the next 10 years to see what kind of influence negative behavior, sometimes associated with adolescence, for example, marijuana, tobacco, and other drug use, what influence that actually has in the developing brain. And we'll look at the kinds of debates that are occurring based on the, that kind of research. Additionally, instead of looking at this kind of black and white, you know, adolescence is a tumultuous time or adolescence is, you know, a fabulous time, try to look at this middle way of understanding what can occur in adolescence and what are the risk factors and protective factors in individuals' lives that sort of tip them from taking these risk moments and turning them into resilient building opportunities. How does that occur? And how can we as teachers uh, play a role in that change? And uh, throughout the presentation, we're really going to be talking about this middle way. It's not that, uh, for example, technology in the adolescent brain is good or bad or whatever. We're going to talk about, you know, something, the, the effects of technology on the brain and in the positive or negative influences that video games could, might have or whatever, right? But we're also going to look at the idea of using technology to actually uh, diagnose certain types of problems. What's happening in lab schools around the world in which you're able to measure a person's heart rate or blood pressure or or to be able to take a saliva sample and understand the level of stress hormones that are triggered by certain teacher interactions, right? So we're going to look at how we can leverage technology, maybe look at this in a more positive way, or even how you can treat certain types of ailments using virtual reality experiences, for example. And so we'll look at the way that adolescents interact with technology, but also how technology can be useful or beneficial towards treating common ills during adolescence. And sort of finding this, you know, very middle way here, that technology isn't to blame for these things. It's just how we put it to use. So have we created, you know, certain policies within our school structures that leverage technology in the best ways? Is it correct that in some school systems around the world, they make kids turn over their cell phones when they walk in the school door and they don't get them back until school ends? Is that a good thing to do? Or are there other ways to approach responsible technology use within your classrooms? We'll look into that as well.
There are also th a lot of things in the news, you know, well, it's about boys, it's about girls. Well, one thing that we really want to uh, emphasize is that there are more similarities than differences. You know, if you take all the men in the world and all the women in the world, there's basically more differences, um, you know, among all of the men and among all of the women than there are between the men and the women. And we'll really pull that apart when we get together as well. We'll also look at some of these things like uh, drug use and the influence of alcohol, tobacco on the brain, or how does that actually occur. But we're going to match that with some other information that looks at the potential or how it is that your brain actually adapts to its environment during this time. And we'll, we'll also look at this as pretty much our, uh, an obligation that we have. Now that we have this opportunity to study the adolescent brain in, in a bit more depth and in a more transdisciplinary way, why is this so important? And there's a big push that's coming out of Center for Disease Control understanding that one in five adolescents has a mental illness that'll persist into adulthood, that mental health care costs are so high, but that understanding that most mental illnesses emerge before adulthood uh, is really important because early intervention could have some, some impact on those figures. And so understanding the context of society. And so we'll look at all these opportunities, but also within the construct of what we see in the popular press and certain myths about the teenage brain or how uh, brain maturation really works or how your frontal lobes just aren't connected or whatever. Or the idea that, oh no, everything has to do with a good family home or a bad family home. Or how we actually measure changes in the teenage brain. Or that basically after adolescence it's all downhill, you can't really learn anything new. And we'll look at all of these different types of myths to make sure that we're really clear about what we do know and what we don't know yet about the adolescent brain. How it involves different types of interactions with different actors in society. What the role of the home and parents is. And also what teachers can do about the adolescence that we were with uh, what is behind this risk taking and how is that actually connected to you know the sort of thrill seeker mentality we think that's apparent with teenagers but is it right and could it be that that maybe the, the ideas we have about how adolescents are thrill seekers um, maybe it doesn't have so much to do with sort of the fear processing elements that we've thought uh, very much along the way. Maybe it has much more to do with uh, decision-making mechanisms in the brain. So could it be that we can understand risky behavior in a very different way if we look at different theories of what's going on in the adolescent brain right now? So rather than adolescents seek out thrills because they love the sense of fear, could it be that the adolescents are actually refining other neural mechanisms that, that are close in, in terms of pathways, but they're actually more related to decision-making processes. So we'll explore those concepts as well. So, and we'll look at the different ways that neuroscientists are approaching a better understanding of the adolescent brain and to sort of just get ourselves up to speed of what the most recent research is saying. We'll also take the time to look at adolescence and also social learning. We know that there's a lot of psychological theories related to social decision making, how people make decisions based on what their peers say, and what role that really plays, especially as it relates to social cognition and social contagion. We'll also consider things like social anxiety disorder and this once believed in theory that all of this is very much related to fear, but could it also be that social stressors are, are more related to reward systems in the brain. So we'll explore some of those different types of theories that are out there about what this means. Now that we know a little bit about what areas of the brain are activated, can that give more credence to some psychological theories than others? And that's what we'll be exploring when we get together. So some of the big ideas that we hope get shared are that the brain, you know, adapts to what it does most. So some of the things that are done that become habituated behavior that are rehearsed repeatedly during early childhood, pre-adolescence and adolescence have a long-term effect on the brain. We'll also look at the reason there's so much more new money being poured into the adolescent brain studies right now. It has a lot to do with the fact that three quarters of psychiatric illnesses really have onset before the age of 24 and that are not visible before the age of 10. So basically it's this adolescent stage that is being seen as key in really tipping. Does this person actually fall into these states of psychiatric illness or not? What tips them? We hope that a take-home message is that these transdisciplinary visions, you know, looking not only at the neurobiology of things or the genetic makeup, or not only looking at the hormonal or chemical structures, 
that are occurring in the brain are not only looking at circuits or what parts of the brain are connected or not connected or refined during adolescence. We have this more global vision that includes uh, visions from psychology, psychiatry, also from education that contribute to our better understanding of the brain. If we look at all of those pieces together, we'll have a more clear understanding of the adolescent brain as it stands right now. So I really encourage you to take the time to sort of think about some of these bigger ideas, come with a lot of questions. I'd love to talk to you more about this information and really from the standpoint of what we can do within the school context that would influence and best serve the adolescents that we work with. Thanks a lot.